Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, M&T Bank, Genova Burns. Additional support is provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantil Commerce Bank, Meridian Capital Group, New Banks, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Henry Street in Brooklyn, Beach Haven in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Prep where he wasn't really good, the Marines, St. John's, I'm going to be an accountant, nah, then I'm going to become a sales manager, nah, I'm going to get married to Carol, now I got to stay, employment business, not an employment business, I'll work the accounting firms, nah, you know, I'll do a little community service for a variety of things. Nah, I'll build a business. Mm, nah, I'm going to join the Columbus Club. I'm going to make, make things take place at the Columbus Club. I'm going to help people with Cooley's anemia. I'm going to be involved with the community. I got Frank Fazzaro. Thanks for being here. Well, you just summed up about six decades of my life in about 30 seconds, but hey, thank you I'm very happy much. I'm six decades. You only look much younger, <laughs> even though that we grew up together. We did. So, so tell me about the... the you, growing up, uh, you were born where? In Brooklyn. I was born in Long Island College Hospital. Now, you see what happened to Long Island College Hospital. It's they just closed. closed and every, every college, every grammar school, high school, and college are all closed now. I, I realize. Maybe you were the omen. I, so you were, you're born over there, and uh, you told me that your father worked at Bond's Clothing. Yes. And your father passed them when you were only one. I was less. I was about nine months old, I think. Uh, now, tell me about this home that you, Grandma owned this house. Right. Uh, on Henry Street, right, 505 Henry to That's be exact. Correct. And in this house in 505, there was eight families, right. but five of them were Fazeros or yeah, related, related. To, related to Fazeros. Right. But you told me a very interesting thing, that many of them really have achieved great presence. Tell me about some of your relatives who lived at uh, Well, you know, uh, take it back. When you talk about my, my father passing, uh, I had my, my brother was uh, three four and a half, four years, years old and, and whatnot. And you think that that was, uh, you know, it was a sad event, obviously, for him. But we live in an apartment house, eight build, eight family in the apartment. Uh, and five of the families, six of the families are related. So we had no, no lack of parental guidance. I had aunts and uncles and so on. And they were all blue-collar people, first-generation Italian-Americans that come here. Their parents had all come from, from the other side. They all fought in World War II and, uh, with valor. Um, and uh, they raised us, and it was, a, it was a terrific, terrific upbringing, a terrific childhood to, to have that. Um, and uh, the cousins answer, we were taught to work hard. We were taught to stand on our own two feet. Now, my cousin James became an architect. My cousin Frank, an air controller. Uh, my brother became a, a doctor of psychology, has a big practice up in Boston. 
And my cousin Delia, I love uh, tremendously, uh, started as uh, she was the one. See, Italian Americans didn't send their, their daughters to college. It was an inappropriate, right? She got a job at the American Stock Exchange as a typist. Okay, went to Brooklyn College at night and and became the secretary of the exchange, and the first woman officer in the in the history of the American Stock Exchange. So it was a it was a great period of my life. It was a great time, family, fun, cousins, just. Wonderful time. You were born in 1947. 47. And then uh, your mother later on gets married to the guy who was the union uh, timekeeper, right? In that neighborhood, you know, everybody worked on the piers, okay? So he was a, he was a longshoreman and became a, a, a timekeeper and, and so on. And his, his brothers were all involved in the union and so on. Uh, he, was, he was a tough guy, but probably the most ethical person I ever met in my life. So what happens later on at about... Seven or eight years of age, you moved to Donald Trump's father's, had found an FHA piece of property on the wastelands of Gravesend. Right. Next to the Belt Parkway, where a little guy by the name of Mike Stoller also lived. That's right. And, we go back. Okay. And the place was called Beach Haven. Right. Now, we go back to the point that I didn't know your name was Frank. Right. It was called Dee Dee. Well, hey, listen. For Everybody had a little, nick- little nickname from the old neighborhood. He had a nickname from the old neighborhood. And as we said, it was a good place growing up. It was, you know, oh, it was we an had parks. Place. You know, there were, little- there were, as you know, there were 31 buildings, uh, 60 families in the building. Everybody had children. So you had 1,800 apartments. Fred Trump was a real gentleman. Fred Trump did a lot for the community, okay? We had a bus that would take us to the beach in the summertime for free. We had a, 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 a they, he donated a, that, uh, our uh, community Agora, center. Right, which was one of the parking lots. Which was the, the, the whole, the, the length and width of a building, okay, that he, he gave up the, the, the revenue from the parking uh, spaces and gave it to the kids. And we had, we, first of all, we were in the shadow of Coney Island. I went to Our Lady of Solace because I couldn't go to the public school, and that was a trolley train and a bus. That's when I started well, commuting you, at eight years old. The pity was you couldn't get into Our Lady of Grace. You know? Our Lady of Grace wouldn't take us because that would have been a 15-minute walk because they only started, if you didn't start there in kindergarten, they weren't going to take you. So we had to go. So it was a trolley train and a bus to Coney Island, uh, and uh, Our Lady of Solace was a block away from Steeplechase. So I had friends in Coney Island, friends in the neighborhood. It was a great place to grow up. We had the beach. We always had money. We always worked for a living. We all could always could, could always make a buck. You see, you worked in the drugstore. I worked in the Bohack. I worked in the drugstore. I worked at, uh, I was a, a, a shill for My Lord of Mule Face Man, the freak shows on Coney Island. So it was a great place to grow up. And everybody you met, you know, was a little bit tainted. Now, what was interesting was when you were growing up, you didn't even have to go to the, to the beach. We used to go to Brighton Six, Base Bay Bay Six. Six, Bay right. Six was the. And then once in a while, if you were lucky, you would have a friend who would sneak you into Brighton Beach Private. We would, okay. we, we would sneak in there all the you time. Know, we would sneak into Brighton Kids. Private and Raven but, Hall and Raven Hall and all the rest. So and tell me the story about the, the 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 storm and your mom and your uncle. Well, we were, uh, I'm eight years old at the time. My brother is 12, and uh, we're uh, in, in Rhode Island, uh, westerly Rhode Island, actually Musquamacut Beach. And it was Hurricane Carol, my wife's name. And they predicted it was going out to sea. It was August of 1954. And um, uh, the, 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 the wind turned, and it came full force into where we were. My mom and my aunt, who was there with my, un- my cousin James, uh, started getting a little panicky and walked a, a block through ankle-deep water, seawater, uh, to my uncle's bar and grill. My uncle, or my, ste- my great-uncle, my, my mother's uncle, had a bar and grill in, uh, uh, in Rhode Island. He had lost a, a bed and breakfast on that property in the hurricane of 1938. It was a, a, a big hurricane. And so I went over there because he had a, a Studebaker and he had a house in town about five miles from the beach. So we got there and they said, let's go, you know, let's get out of here. He refused to leave his bar and grill. This guy was as tight as a drum and he was afraid someone was going to steal his liquor. So we sat, we sat there. Well, 10 minutes later, the, 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 we're right across from the beach. The water starts coming in. Now we got no place to go. The, 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 the car's underwater, can't use that. We climbed up in the attic, and we spent four hours in that attic. That attic was ripped from the rest of the bar and grill, and we were literally floating in the, um, in the storm. And the biggest impression I had, and I remember it clearly, was my mom. She was a rock. Now, here's a, 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 a woman 
who is at this time is is a, a, a widow with a, a an eight year old and a twelve year old, and you, you don't know with every wave that hit us, we'd spin and 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 the place would crack and so on. And, and she was a rock. She was a rock. A neighbor had come over with a with a. Uh, her daughter, she started to panic. But, but your mother was truly inspirational in your life. There's no she question. was. She always smiled. We did not know, it, it, you know, in effect, that we didn't have a father. Okay? We had uncles, aunts, cousins, and it was just an incredible thing. And then uh, my mother remarried, and he, you know, he was a tough guy, but uh, ethical, honest, uh, and treated us nicely. So you go to Lady Asalas, and then you're ready to go... Where were you going to go? I could have walked Brooklyn to Lincoln. Tech. I could have walked, walked to, Lincoln. to Lincoln. I made Brooklyn Tech. I was a good test taker, but I had to go to Brooklyn Prep because my brother went there. My right. brother was a class he was valedictorian. A- he was a captain of the baseball team, editor of the yearbook. Okay, I get there. It's four trains and a fifteen minute walk through Crown Heights to get right, there. But we had the McDonald train. We were only about a ten minute walk. Well, you had to take the D train to the Brighton local to the Brighton Express to the Franklin Avenue shuttle. Okay, and if I left school at three o'clock, I got home at five fifteen. Hey. Then they expected me to do three hours of homework, which wasn't going to happen. And also work in the drugstore and do some delivery. Right, exactly, and the pizzeria. Right. So then, you know, you're seventeen years of age. You say to yourself, because you did, you're such a good student. Right. You said, I'm going to join the Marines. I get this picture of you joining the Marines. Yeah. But in order to join the Marines, you had to go to Mama. What happened? Well, I knew I wanted to go to college eventually. But I had it in my heart that I graduated last in my class, okay? Uh, and, after, you know, I was always, a U Lewis's brother was a mantra at Brooklyn Prep. Graduated last month. I got this idea. I went down to Floyd Bennett, and I took an exam. And the guy said, wow, you did well. And he gives me another exam, and he says, wow, you did well. And this, I said, what was the second exam? He said, that was the Marine Cadet Program. You can become a pilot. I said, sign me up, you know, this kind of thing. But I had to get my mother's permission in those days. And this is uh, 1964. I'm just turning 17. Okay, And um, they were talking about doing away with the draft. Vietnam was not even on the back page of the newspapers. So I go to my mother because I need her permission. And she refused to sign. And we have a big fight. And I said, I'll I'll just wait until I'm 18. Then I go on my own. And that was really the turning point. She had no point. She signed. I went down, signed up, and uh, it was after I got out of Paris Island, they told me you had to be 21 to get in that program. They never, they, so so they then you, never dis- told me that. you decided that you were not going to spend four years. No. I, my, my thought at that point, I wanted to go to college, so I did my time, okay, and uh, it was a reserve program. I did about a year on active duty, and then uh, came back, uh, now, got how, a job. Now, why, how did St. John's hire you? I had to beg my way into St. John's. I had to wear my uniform, and there was a, a priest at Brooklyn Prep who had taken a liking to me. He, he pulled a string, and I went there in my uniform to beg sympathy, okay? Now, but you said to me, you you going to St. John's at night. During the day, you were working for a company called Arlen. Yes. Which was the predecessor of the people from Bed Bath & Beyond. That's correct. And you did what? You were in a cat's uh, payable? You no, did no, everything. No, no, I was My first promotion was into the mailroom, Okay. And, um, you know, but, but go, t- take it. The, the, my time in the service was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because I, I left there with a sense of confidence. When you go to the Marine Corps, and it, was, it wasn't terrible. I was a kid, 17. I was the youngest. When I signed up, the youngest, youngest person in the Marine Corps. And I, I, one of the youngest sergeants that ever, you know, in the, in the Corps. But it was a turning point because it gave me confidence. And I think service it taught me, you know, taught me some discipline. Um, and uh, I always consider myself a fake Marine because when I, by the time I got out, Vietnam was raging, and we never got activated. I became a crew chief in a helicopter squadron, so my life expectancy over there would have been about, about 10 days. But uh, So I was, it turned out it, it was a blessing, but I always uh, you know, had that in my heart, and I have such respect for the military even till today, the guys that really went over there and, and, you know, and, and, and served the country. So now you're at St. John's and you're at Orleans. Right. And you're you doing that full-time? I'm going to school full-time. I'm going to work full-time. They took me off the time clock, and uh, they, they paid me a salary. I actually went into their traffic department and uh, working with the, with, the, with the traffic director and the, and the CFO. I travel with them a little bit. And, you know, I love the job. I love working. And the greatest thing about St. John's, and this is the Brooklyn Center. That's I mentioned right. It was this, is this is, you know, my daughter asked me how I picked my college. I said, Jackie, subway map. It was one token. 
At any rate, it was downtown Brooklyn. As soon as the classes ended, I'd jump on the train, work Saturdays uh, all day. I worked till 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night. Loved the job, loved the people. They loved me. And uh, How did you decide to become an accountant? Well, you know, I, 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 I went to St. John's School of Business. That was the first major accounting, alphabetically. Right, but I knew you grew up with all the Jews, but the Jews were supposed to be doctors or accountants or lawyers. Oh, well, yeah, well, the, 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 the successful Jews were, were, were doctors and lawyers. The well, not so successful became accountants, but I, I, I became an accountant. And I had, by the time I graduated St. John's, the, the, you know, Vietnam was at, uh, probably at its height. Uh, the draft was like uh, everything. I was already a veteran. They loved me in the, the interviewing process. So I joined Price Waterhouse and spent uh, almost four years there. So at Price Waterhouse, you leave Price Waterhouse to, to go to work for one of their clients in the sales business, right? Right. And at that job, talk well, uh, that was a small uh, importer of automotive sound equipment. Uh, I, I was an adversary to the president of the company because we were brought in. That company was purchased by uh, NMS and the old Seaberg, uh, Seaberg industry, the old jukebox people. They bought this company, and there was a very acrimonious relationship between the, 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 the purchaser and, and the acquired company, which was my client. We were brought in. Uh, it, to to keep an eye on the president to report back to the parent company and it was a very uh, difficult uh, audit. Audits are conducted on materiality. Everything was material. But it was it was a good experience. It you, was a wonderful experience. You spent, you spent uh, how many years there? I spent about uh, two years there. Uh, they and, and I got promoted to uh, you know national sales manager left. They, they said Frank do the job and. Uh, I fell in love with it. I, I traveled all over the United States. So then you then you got married to this woman you met in college, yeah. Carol. Yeah. And but Carol had uh, Crohn's and colitis. So iliitis, yeah. iliitis, Crohn's, Crohn's and colitis. Right. So you had to stay close by. Well, yeah. And then one day, this yeah. individual by the name of Steve Goldstein, yes. wonderful and a, guy, uh, another guy by the name Mark Gilbert. Steve worked with you at, at, at Price Waterhouse. Then Steve uh, went to work for a company called Chris Associates. Right. And this is what, 1974? It's uh, it, 1974, 73, 74, he contacts me. I'm traveling 90% of the time. And this is really causing a problem at home, okay, Carl, with the, you know, uh, uh, the colitis and so on. Uh, so uh, it, it was a tough decision. They, Mark and Steve, decided they had a little experience in the staffing business. They want to start go on their own, entrepreneurial spirit. And they asked me to join them. And I said, this is nuts. I'll do this for six months and get a real job. And that was 41 years ago. Now, I remember 41 years ago, because Steve and I used to take the other tra train from Sheepshead Bay right. into the city when he told me he was going to business. And he said, you know, come visit me and my partners in the office. And I go into the office and I see Dee <laughs> Yes. I say, Dee Dee, what are you doing here? Yeah, it said, that's... That's uh, Brooklyn, okay? We had uh, known each other when we were seven, eight, ten years old, and then we, go, you know, we, we, we went our own way, and then Steve brought you back into our lives, and you wound up marrying uh, uh, Paula Sutker, who was a dear, worked with us for 30 years, that's thereabouts, wonderful woman. You never gave me 10% of, the, of your wedding gifts, right. which you should have. But you were there, and you even came, you were a cuppa holder. Yes, you were yes. There. I was so at the you, wedding. You were at the wedding. So let's, let's move on. So you, you specialized more at that time and over the years in the public accounting realm. Yeah, uh, that business. was my background as a CPA. So I didn't know anything about the staffing business, but I knew how to sell, and I knew, how to, I, I knew if you got in front of people and developed relationships. It's about work ethic. The only thing that made us successful was work ethic. We, I mean, we put in 12 hours a day, 13, 14 hours a day for years. And, and, and I called on all the CPA firms, got very active in the state society, uh, became a vice president. I was on their, uh, on their board for many, many years and started programs with them and became very close to the, all the senior people in the public accounting profession. And they were great clients and it was a, a great And they also relationship. helped you because the, the, the accounting firms are in certain ways the consigliere to their clients. To their clients, and then you were able Make to get introductions, introductions to their clients. And everything. And it, and it, now, you were saying be, you were working 12 to 14 hours a day, and I do know that. But you and Steve had this opportunity during that period of time. To start with this. Okay, to be a little rambunctious. Yes. Okay, and during that period of time, I don't know how, but you made a couple of TV shows. You were on the Today Show, you were on the Cup Show, you were on the David Susskind Show, and you were on the News 4 Show 
with uh, Chuck Scarborough. Chuck Scarborough became a friend. Now, what were you doing? We had a little lost in our hearts, and we wanted to. Uh, it started with uh, Frank Sinatra doing a, 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 a um, uh, an event for a birthday party for Governor Carey, you Carey at the time. So we went to. We, we put on tuxedos, got a one over the wall, up, got him to set up a table for us, and and that was our first uh, crashing event. And we did that for for many many years. Had right, the production night of a hundred stars. Night of a hundred stars, and in the picture of all the hundred stars, they had three unidentified people. That's right. So from that, it was an interesting, cute thing. And I remember when you lived in Staten Island, you used to have the pictures of you and Steve with a variety of these people. Yes. So that was that, that was interesting, and they were they were even going to do a little movie life story on the CBS, crash. CBS, yes, CBS contacted us. We signed a contract with them, and then Tish bought CBS and stopped the two-hour movies. And they had uh, John Ritter was going to John Ritter was, was going to play, play my Frank part, Fizarro. and they had read a whole story about what we. It was it was a fun part of our lives, and it was a way to to you know to to, to do something lost in this without hurting anyone. No question. But what happened right after that is that you met me again on something. Right. And I said to you, there's an opportunity that you should join the Columbus Citizens right. Foundation. This was a, a, a great organization. You, you've been on the board for 21 years. 21 years. Uh, in addition to being on the board, you were the president. You're the chairman uh, of the chairman of the board right now. But the, the Columbus Foundation has been... An intimate part of your life. Let's yes. talk a little bit about that. Well, the, Columbus, the, the most visible thing we do is run the Columbus Day Parade. And for years and years we ran this parade, and it was a, a group of people got together and to promote the parade, promote Italian heritage and Italian pride. I always been proud of being an Italian, but I really didn't know what it meant, okay, really. And by my involvement with the Columbus Foundation, uh, I started working my way through the, the, the process, and I eventually uh, the fellow who ran the parade with his wife for 20 years, just had a, an argument, walked out, and they asked me to run the parade. I got an opportunity to put the parade. Now, that was a great opportunity uh, for a you know, kid from Brooklyn to put this three-hour performance live in the streets, all this mayhem, police, fire, sanitation, and so on. We got, and we brought in, I had the Rockettes come in. We had the Broadway shows. You also brought it to TV. We brought it, we, well, it was on Channel, uh, Channel 11, and I got it on NBC. I called up the, uh, the, the chairman of, the, pres the general manager of NBC and told him I wanted to come and talk to him. We moved it over to NBC. It was on NBC for about 12 years, and it's now on ABC, WABC. They do a fabulous job. Uh, and that started, uh, you know, us in the right direction as far as getting that national coverage and so on. And uh, it, the organization evolved into a philanthropic organization. Uh, we now do 2.25 million per year in scholarships. I'm very proud of that. Right, I you started, were responsible for the Adopt the Scholar program. Well, I started, I had this idea that uh, we should create a, a, a program and not just people, arbitrarily ask people for money, but to start a program where you, we went to a member, a friend of the foundation, and do this. And, you know, very simple concept, okay? Uh, I, I thought it would be successful. It's now gone over $15 million in, in donations, mostly from the, uh, from the members who put up either $25,000 for an annual a scholarship four years and it's over, or $100,000 for a perpetual scholarship. And we have 600 kids in the program. And uh, the other thing is when I became president, I said, no more. We had every celebrity grand marshal you can imagine, Sinatra. We had Sophia Loren and so on and so forth. I said, we've got to stop this. I said, we, so, you know, our, our first uh, real hero, I thought, was Ken Langone, who started with nothing and wasn't supposed to go to college uh, and now gave $250 million thereabouts to NYU. And, and from there, Joe Plumeri, you had Frank Bisignano, we had uh, Maria Bartiromo, who's been doing the parade, dear friend, been doing it for 15 years. And every one of them raised a million dollars plus. And then we had honorees and so on. So that now uh, we're, we're up to two as a two million two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, and we've done, you know, a number of other things. Uh, when the um, uh, college board uh, decided to do away with Italian as an offering, which means uh, that's that special program in high schools across the country, and without that program, they they won't hire an Italian teacher in the culture, and everybody won't have that opportunity to cut that. We went to Italy. And I uh, got the Italian government to put up $2 million with the Cuomo family. They were very instrumental. And Lou Tallarini, who was a president prior to myself. And we were the first ones to step up and add another half a million dollars to that and negotiate with the college board. And that's now back in perpetuity. We also raised a million dollars, over a million dollars for the military.
and also you raised money recently, close to $200,000, for the restoration of St. Pat's. Yes, uh, Ken called us up and said we should get involved, and, um, you know, we started at 130000 went up to about 175000 there. But you've been always very involved with, it's a genetic disease over there. We have a picture of this nurse who shouldn't have been alive because the lifespan of Cooley's anemia was like 15 years now. She's 25. She's a nurse handling Cooley's anemia. That's correct. And the pity is it's a picture of a young little child who didn't make it. Um, let's talk about the little thing on your... I love how this is... This is uh, uh, we were... Uh, Lou Tallarini and I were honored by the, uh, the president of Italy. Actually, the secretary of state came to the United States and... Uh, we were uh, na- knighted as a, uh, with the title of Commandadore, which is an honorary title, uh, for the work that we had done, you know, for the Italian uh, government and the AP program. And that's always been, you know, Italy has contributed more to the world than any country of its size, art, science, culture, and so on. That's a true Italian-American, and, and we try to... Let's talk a little bit about family and then the, the company. Oh. Okay. I, I'm blessed. I have uh, an incredible, my son Christopher and my daughter Jackie, uh, two wonderful Christopher's children. Christopher's married to? Christopher's married to Michelle. They have four girls, five and under. Name Isabella, girl. Gianna, Sophia, and Francesca. Okay. okay. Uh, four yeah. girls, five and under. My daughter Jackie has Alex and Michael Giovanni. And your daughter is a, uh, like a professor or she's? She was uh, teaching at NYU. She's married to a professor at Princeton, uh, Kevin Wayne. And uh, they have uh, the two boys, a uh, lovely home in Princeton. And, uh, and you and Carol been married how many years? We're married 43 years. A wonderful woman. God bless. And we've married 43 years, and she's put up with my antics for 43 years. The business itself has grown tremendously. We're, we have 100 people in our shop and, and on a, and temps, probably three, 400 people out on billing. Uh, and it's been a blessing. It's been a, a whole life has been a blessing. I, I, sometimes I, I, I just... I think about it, and I say how lucky we are to have grown up as kids in, in, in Brooklyn, to have grown up and, 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 and uh, you know, and, and been blessed that way. Our parents educated us and sent us out and said, you know, drop us a line. Let, let us know how you're doing. But as you said to me before, and which is something that I try to emphasize on every one of my life story shows, that opportunities, you have to seek the opportunity. You have to take the cards and play the cards. It's it's. You know, there's an old saying. Adaptability and versatility. Right. There's an old saying that, uh, you know, uh, I'm a self made man. No one's a self made man. Okay. You have opportunities in life. People open doors for you to help you along, and you have to take advantage of that. And it's work ethic, it's discipline that, 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 that's more important than anything. You don't have to be the brightest candle in a church, but if you're willing to work hard. Hey, you know, the kid, Brooklyn Prep number one. One the other side. One the other side. So thanks for being here today. My and thanks pleasure. Thanks for being a friend for so many years. My pleasure.